Chapter 15 Conclusion If there is one thing more than another that is before the minds of the saints continually, it is the subject of the gathering. Mill, Star 3372, 1871 when the gospel of Jesus Christ was restored to the earth, the principle of gathering was one of its most prominent themes. All of the saints believed in and were activated by the Spirit, as if they were being drawn into one large family. The sentiments and importance of this doctrine were best expressed by the prophet Joseph Smith. It was through his teachings that the indispensable nature of gathering was established. The prophet said, One of the most important points in the faith of the Church of the Latter-day Saints, through the fullness of the everlasting gospel, is the gathering of Israel. TPJS, page 92. All that the prophets that have written, from the days of righteous Abel, down to the last man that has left any testimony on record for our consideration, in speaking of the salvation of Israel in the last days, goes directly to show that it consists in the work of the gathering. TPJS, page 83. In addition to all temporal blessings, there is no other way for the saints to be saved in these last days, than by the gathering, as the concurrent testimony of all the holy prophets, clearly proves, it is also the concurrent testimony of all the prophets, that this gathering together of all the saints, must take place before the Lord comes to take vengeance upon the ungodly TPJS, page 183. It was the design of the councils of heaven before the world was, that the principles and laws of the priesthood, should be predicated upon the gathering of the people in every age of the world. Jesus did everything to gather the people, and they would not be gathered, and he therefore poured out curses upon them. TPJS, page 308. For any saint to believe in the gospel, but not in the gathering was a mark of apostasy. The apostle Orson Pratt wrote, The gathering of the saints is a very important item of our faith. It is founded upon divine revelation, both ancient and modern. None of the saints can be dilatory upon this subject, and still retain the Spirit of God. To neglect or be indifferent about gathering is just as displeasing in the sight of God as to neglect or be indifferent about baptism for the remission of sins. Mill, Star 10 241, and President Brigham Young preached the same sentiments. If a saint who has received the Holy Ghost, is counseled to gather with the saints, to come home, and he neglects to come, he has no further claim to the blessings promised unto the faithful, who obey all the commandments, his light becomes darkness, and remaining in the state, where God is he cannot come, for the ordinances in the house of the Lord, and Zion, and her stakes, are as necessary for a full salvation, as baptism is for a partial salvation, and the voice of the Good Shepherd is to all saints, even to the ends of the earth, gather yourselves together, come home, and more to the saints in the United States, Canada, and the British Isles, come home. Come home, O oh, ye saints in the United States. Will you listen to the voice of the Good Shepherd? Will you gather? Will you be obedient to the heavenly commandments? Mill, Star 1422. President Young concluded by saying that those who waited for better circumstances or conditions would never come, and they would leave their carcasses to rot in the midst of the Gentiles, and their faith and hope would depart from them. In those early days of the church the spirit and feeling was to flee out of the world to Zion to enjoy the spirit, the associations, and the work of Zion. But now the doctrine is to stay in the world, build up the branches and missions, instead of Zion, while the Gentiles are moving to Zion. It is almost strange that such belief and enthusiasm for this principle has been reversed in such a short time. Fifty years after the church was restored, Apostle George Q. Cannon defined the principle of gathering as unchangeable and irrevocable by saying, Who is there I speak to you, my brethren and sisters, who have been connected with this church from the beginning who is there that can recall a single instance of recantation of any of its principles? Has there ever been a doctrine declared by the authorities of this church, as a part of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that they have had to take back or modify? Not one. Has there been anything in the organization that has had to be perfected? No. The organization was as perfect in theory being revealed of God 50 years ago, as it is today in practice after years of experience, practically carrying it out in these mountains. That constitutes the strength of this work. It is its infallibility. Not that man connected with it is infallible, for he is fallible. But the work itself, its principles, and everything connected with it, is infallible, having a divine origin, being revealed of God. It was a wonderful thing to state, as was stated right at the outset of this work, that it should be preached in every land, that its doctrine should be proclaimed in every tongue throughout the world, and that it should gather from every nation under heaven, men and women who should be numbered as its converts. A remarkable feature, something unheard of, that the principles of this religion when preached, should have the effect to gather out from every nation, 
kindred tongue and people, those who espouse them. Yet every word has been fulfilled. Wherever the elders of this church have gone they have gone accompanied by that wonderful power, the power of gathering the people together, not of one race, not of one language, but people of every race and of every language, showing the adaptability of its principles to the people of the frozen north, as well as to those of the torrid south. They have come of their own accord. They have forsaken home, friends, old associations, ancestral tombs, and everything of this character, that is calculated to bind men to their native land. They have severed all these, and have gathered out and cast their lots with the people of their faith in these mountains. And this has been a peculiar feature of this work from the very commencement, and it will continue to be as long as the gospel is preached. J.D. 24. 184. Previously press, Canon had defined the eternal nature of these principles by stating, It cannot be expected by any person who has any faith or confidence in the plan of salvation, or in the scriptures which contain an account of that plan that it would lead them to believe in different forms of doctrine, or that it would teach one class of men, that one portion of the gospel was necessary, and another portion unnecessary, or cause any portion of the people to believe that a certain item of the gospel was essential to salvation, and cause another portion of the people to believe that the same item of the gospel was non-essential. Such a view is irreconcilable with the teachings of Jesus and his apostles, and of all that is left on record concerning the gifts and power of the Holy Ghost, and its office among the children of men. J.D. 12 363 Press. Canon had no intention of the doctrine of gathering ever being changed, but the prophet Joseph Smith knew that such changes could occur and stated that they would. He warned the saints, and if any man preach any other gospel than that which I have preached, he shall be cursed, and some of you here now who hear me shall see it and know that I testify the truth concerning them. There is no error in the revelations which I have taught. Historical Record 7548 Every revelation and commandment pertaining to the gathering is now lightly passed over with the excuse that they no longer apply. Thus the saints of today are faced with this two-fold dilemma, obeying the Lord's revelations and adhering to the spirit which prompts the gathering or else repudiating them by placing their trust in the arm of flesh and following the counsels of men. Hence, some remain in Babylon because of false advice or influence, while others are gathering to Zion, because they believe in these revelations and are inspired to do so. Most of those who accept the gospel will obey many of its precepts, but they will not gather. Why? Something has persuaded them to remain in the lands of Babylon wealth, social position, or climate. Or, someone has persuaded them to remain their relatives, friends, or supposedly an inspired leader. Somehow or in some way the saints are not gathering as they were commanded to do. Jesus warned his disciples that in the last days there would arise those that if it were possible they shall deceive the very elect. Then in our dispensation he gave the commandment that ye are called to bring to pass the gathering of mine elect, for mine elect hear my voice, and harden not their hearts and they, shall be gathered in unto one place upon the face of this land. D and C 29 7-8. Hence, the elect know the voice of the good shepherd and gather, while those who are not the elect and harden their hearts are deceived. The prophet Joseph said that the parable of the wedding supper pertained to the doctrine of gathering. And when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper, and bade many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came, and shewed his lord these things. Then the master of the house being angry said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor, and the maimed, and the halt, and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say unto you, that none of those men which were bidden, shall taste of my supper. Luke 14 15-24 Those of Ephraim who are bidden to gather but excuse themselves, shall never eat with the bridegroom. 
but those poor, halt, and blind of the ten tribes who will be compelled to gather will be saved. Thus, in the preceding pages we have established the following reasons for God's elect to be gathered. 1. The gathering of God's people has been a principle taught and practiced from the pre-existence to the eternal kingdoms. 2. It was given by revelation to those of this dispensation as a commandment from God. 3. Keys of gathering were restored by Moses to the saints in these last days, and those keys were never revoked. 4. From the Old Testament to the Doctrine and Covenants, true saints are filled with the spirit of gathering. Nowhere in Revelations or Scriptures have the saints been told to scatter or remain in Babylon. 5. The spirit of gathering is a principle that is initially revealed to a saint when he receives the gift of the Holy Ghost. 6. The teaching to stay in Babylon is encouraging saints to marry among the worldly and live their laws, standards, passions. Such admonitions leave saints to the temptation, influence and spirit of the world. 7. Teachings which tend to keep the saints among the worldly are in opposition to God's principles of cooperative efforts and the united. Order. 8. Temporal salvation is affected by this law, and when the destroying angel shall sweep over the world, the saints who are not gathered will be destroyed. 9. The obedient who are gathered shall be caught up to meet the Savior when he comes those not gathered will not. 10. Many of the most important spiritual blessings in this life, and in the life to come, are predicated upon this principle. 11. Those who gather not only live in Zion and enjoy its spirit and good associations, but can be buried with them in the promise of dwelling with them forever in the heavens to come. What would a society of saints be like if they were all gathered together working for the cause of Zion? President Brigham Young was given a vision of what it could be and should be like. I have looked upon the community of the Latter-day Saints in vision, and beheld them organized as one great family of heaven, each person performing his several duties in his line of industry, working for the good of the whole, more than for individual aggrandizement, and in this I have beheld the most beautiful order that the mind of man can contemplate, and the grandest results for the upbuilding of the kingdom of God, and the spread of righteousness upon the earth. J.D. 12 153 and then he added that the order of God among men is not complete without a gathering. But the principle of gathering does not pertain to just this life. It is a part of one's faith that draws men towards God beyond the grave. President John Taylor said, It is the crown's principalities, the powers, the thrones, the dominions, and the associations with the gods that we are after, and we are here to prepare ourselves for these things. We are after eternal exaltation in the celestial kingdom of God, and we want to feel that this is the main object of existence, that this is why we were born, and that God has revealed himself from the heavens, restored the holy priesthood, and gathered us together in order that we might form a nucleus through whom he could communicate his will, through whom he could accomplish his work upon the earth and introduce the gospel of the Son of God to the nations of the earth, and gather together his elect from the four quarters of the globe, through whom he could introduce upon the earth the principles that exist in the heavens, that we might be taught to do the will of God on the earth as it is done in the heavens, that we might be a pure people, a virtuous people, a holy people, free from the vices and corruptions of the world, and that we might learn the laws of light, truth and intelligence, from the fountain of all intelligence, for we are told the glory of God is intelligence. This is why we have been gathered together. J.D. 24 198 Apostle George Q. Cannon, as though with prophetic insight into this beautiful principle, warned the saints that their success or failure with the gospel could be determined by their attitude toward the doctrine of gathering. It is not the numbers of the Latter-day Saints that gives them weight in the world, so much as it is their union and their distinctive virtues, which in the struggle for existence and supremacy, always give victory and triumph to their possessors. If the Latter-day Saints desert the principles of the gospel and abandon themselves to the vices and corruptions that prevail in the world, and to which they would have been subjected, had they remained in a scattered condition, they would have no more power than any other people of like number. But that which will ever give them superiority, so long as they possess them, are those virtues which their religion makes imperative upon them, and without which they cannot remain the people of God. There can be no question about the future destiny of what are called the Mormon people, if they will only be true to themselves. Mill, Star 6350 the doctrine of gathering extends beyond the realms of tribes and nations. It stretches far beyond the limited scope of man's mortal mind. The Apostle Orson Hyde revealed a portion of that celestial gathering which includes planets, suns, and kingdoms reaching into space and eternity. God says he will gather all things into one, then he will gather the earth likewise and all that is in it in one. The gathering will be upon a larger scale in time to come, for by and by the stars of heaven will fall. Which way will they go? They will rally to a grand
grand center, and there will be one grand constellation of worlds. I pray that we may be there, and shine among those millions of worlds that will be stars in the Almighty's crown. The great gathering of celestial worlds. The earth will have to be removed from its place, and reel to and fro like a drunkard. The fact is, it has got to leave the old track in which it has roamed in time past, and beat a new track, and say the Lord, come up here. What is he going to do with it? Why, take it where the sun will shine upon it continually, and there shall be no more night there, and the hand of God will wipe away the tears from all faces. Come up here, O earth for I want the saints who have passed through much tribulation to be glorified with you, and then I will give the earth to the meek. For I will take the curse from it, and rebuke the destroyer for your sakes, and bring all things in subjection to you, and you shall dwell in everlasting light. Now it is half day and half night, but I tell you it is not going to be half and half, but there will be no night there. We have but one sun to shine upon us, but when the earth is taken out of this orbit, it will come in contact with rays of other suns that illuminate other spheres, their rays will dazzle our earth, and make the glory of God rest upon it so that there will be no more night there. JD 1 130. Hence, the dominions of heaven are administered by the fundamental principle of gathering, and into each degree of glory, are gathered subjects who have adapted themselves through obedience to the laws that pertain to that measure of glory. Even hell gathers its own subjects who have been attracted by and are obedient to false doctrines, errors, and superstitions. The doctrine of gathering has been, and always will be an eternal principle of the gospel of Jesus Christ regardless of who may oppose it, and those who teach against it, by advising others to remain in Babylon, shall answer for the blood of the innocent, when they perish in the coming desolations. But those who gather, and help others to do so, shall be blessed as saviors upon Mount Zion. From the pre-existence, throughout mortality, and into the eternities to come, men and spirits are being attracted and gathered by truth or by error. Habitations and principles are being acquired by selection. In making a multitude of choices throughout the years, men become products of their own expressive desires. The man who becomes accustomed to a lifetime in saloons, gambling dens, and dives, would feel disturbed and uneasy in a church. Likewise a faithful and devoted man of God would feel the same uneasiness and distress in a saloon or gambling den. That gradual selection and attraction of men and things is inherent and eternal in its nature. Their eternal destiny is dependent upon who and what they are gathered to. The success or failure of the gospel in any age, has been dependent upon the unity of God's people. It is for this reason they have always been commanded to gather. It has been an absolute rule and a strict commandment that the children of God should gather to Zion that, they might be worthy of gathering in the Zion of heaven. 